Okay, let's be frank about this. <laughs> You're fried. Uh, lunch is coming up. You've heard a number of very interesting talks. Let's get right to this, get some sort of value add, and set you free. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I have a very simple message. My concern was, do I have to worry about the people when I model network advantage? What I'm going to show you is a research strategy and some initial results from a virtual world where the answer is no. I don't need to worry about the differences. There are clear network styles associated with individual differences, but those individual differences don't affect the achievement that's associated with network advantage. That's a fairly provocative claim, but forgive me, some of you would have seen this at Michigan uh, um, uh, or at uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon, um, uh, and so that you would have uh, heard this message um, uh, before, but perhaps some better uh, questions about it have come up. We won't have time for questions, uh, but I'm pretty easy to Google, and uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say, because this afternoon's job, after I listen to uh, John, is going to be uh, editing this for journal submission. So here's the basic uh, imagery. Perfect. How many of you are familiar with the idea that the brokers in a network, the hubs in a network, the connectors in a network have a competitive advantage? Okay, about half. Uh, so let me briefly explain. The network to the, the graph to the left is taken from a recent book uh, I did called Neighbor Networks. There's lots of the, these uh, graphs out there. It's a composite of six different organizations, senior people, it's investment bankers, it's stock analysts, it's, made, it's uh, senior managers. The horizontal axis is contrasting, it's a simple concentration measure, of the percent of your network time and energy that's consumed in one group. If everyone you know knows one another, you're consumed in the one group. To the extent that you have contacts in different groups, the imagery is that you have access to different ways of thinking because information gets sticky inside these groups and a person who has contact with those groups can move that information around. In essence, these brokers, these hubs, these connectors are a vehicle for clearing sticky information in the information market. What we know is that the people who are connected to people who are not already connected, you got that imagery? There's a little picture of it there at the, uh, to the left. Um, are rewarded by organizations. They make more money, they're promoted more quickly, the industries reward them with recognition. No matter how we look at who's doing well and who's doing badly, the people who are these hubs do better holding constant a variety of background variables. And what you see is that red line where the vertical axis in the left graph, zero means you're getting paid what's typical for someone like you. You're getting recognized, what's typical for someone like you. A whole series of that's what's usual for people like you. One is that you're one standard deviation ahead of people like you. Negative one, you're one standard deviation behind. And you see that downward sloping curve. People who are the hubs and networks are rewarded. You okay with that image? Uh, forgive me for asking, but I wanna make sure we're getting very good, efficient communication. Okay, <laughs> second bit. Those data, those graphs, uh, the, the graph to the left, graphs like that, have been assembled by averaging across people inside intervals on the x-axis. And what ends up happening there is you obscure an important feature to the data. The graph to the right is what the raw data looks like that I've averaged to get the graph to the left. And what you see is the standard deviation to the left goes from negative 2 up to positive 2.5. If you go over to the other side, the standard deviation goes down to negative 3 and goes up to 7.0. In particular, there's massive heterogeneity among the network brokers. Some people do really, really well when they're a broker. That's where the extraordinary achievements come up. But a lot of people die on the vine, stretch there like Jesus on a cross, trying to find some way to get things done. And all they do is end up stressed out and burned out. Yeah? The only consistent feature to this graph on the left is that people in closed networks don't do well. So response to this has been, A, what are the behaviors associated with success when you're a broker? So for example, um, Woody Powell has a chapter uh, in his book with John Padgett that's coming out this summer on emergence, where he describes the behavior of the brokers in the biotech market in a city was the primary explanation for why biotech clusters developed in some cities and not in others. 
In the cities like DC, Philadelphia, New York, the broker institutions insisted on controlling the local environment and no new growth happened. In the cities where clusters did develop, Boston, San Diego, um, San Francisco, the brokers in the center went out of their way to create other brokers. In essence, it was a collateral brokerage. They spun off these other hubs. And there you get the cluster growth. A lot of professors have the same problem. They want students to look just like them. And what they grow is mushrooms. At the other extreme are the people who try to make you more than you might be. Whatever it is you're going to be, I'm going to find a way to help you do that. That's exactly the analogy that Woody finds. The fascinating piece to this is it wasn't the broker position that gave you the advantage, but what did you do with it? Kate Kellogg has a, a study that uh, it will be probably forthcoming in AGS. She had an earlier one in 09 uh, AGS uh, that shows the primary function of brokers in her hospital groups is to keep lawyers and doctors away from each other because when they have too much contact, they really irritate each other. And what she found was the brokers would pass from the doctors to the lawyers the essential bits you needed about doctoring in order to do your legal job. And they would pass back to the doctors the bit of information you needed about legal code in order to meet the legal requirements of the institution. They served as, to use Lada's terms, as an information filter. But it was a productive filter that let them gain tremendous advantage and for the hospital to develop. The point of this is that maybe it's not the opportunity that the network creates, maybe it's the way you use it that becomes a key variable. And there's a lot of studies now coming out that emphasize the importance of how you behave. Well, that raises the issue of, is it personalities? Is it kinds of people? And there's a lot of work now emerging in, in my area, in economic sociology, where people say certain nationalities are prone to being able brokers and others not. Certain personalities, like self-monitoring people, are prone to um, being successful brokers and others not. This is the dilemma I want to address. Because I can measure personality in a variety of ways, thousands and thousands of ways, and there's no barrier to entry. I myself have produced some number of Cosmo kind of personality tests. Are you a pretty networker? Uh, which is a 10, 10 point uh, scale of yes, you're a great networker, uh, no, you suck out loud. Uh, very simple kind of imagery, and people love this stuff, which means there's no end to new indices coming up, which means I can never answer the question in a definitive way. There's always a new entrant. So what I proposed was the following. I propose to break the network into role-specific parts. And I'm going to use variation within people across the parts to get some estimate of how much variation in networks is due to the person as opposed to random chance or the kind of job you're doing. So in this case, I'm going to be looking at things like network constraint, number of uh, non-redundant ties, kinds of reach um, uh, measures. Imagine that I have, um, in this graph to the um, uh, left, uh, I broke James into one role he's doing, a second role he's doing, a third role he's doing. So this would be managers, it's one project you did, it's another project you did, it's another project you did. It could be a professor who's got one class they did, another class they did, another class they did, or a research project they put together, a research team, whatever it is, it's different roles. What you can see is that James tends to build the same kind of network in each of the different performances of his network. Robert tends to build the same kind of networks in the different networks that he builds. If you go to the right, however, you can see that James has a network that's extremely high in the first role, extremely low in the second role, and about average in the third role. The question is, there's lots of reasons why we do build different networks in the different projects we do, but how consistent is it? To the extent that there is a network style, a personal preference for how I build networks, some people love to build a closed network where everybody gets to know everybody else. It's a little walled garden where it's safe and it's supportive and you can push people to get things done. Other people enjoy the joy of just variety, lots of variation. Is that a personal style? One could imagine to the left, yes. But to the right, people are adapting. They're changing the kind of network they can. I just want to know how often that happens and what are the implications for the returns to your performance. These are the two outcome variables. 
Do kinds of people build kinds of networks? More importantly, are there kinds of returns to kinds of people in whatever network they're in? You okay with this image? So let's go straight to some results, given the time. I'm going to go into uh, EverQuest. These data were gathered by um, Dimitri Williams and kindly provided by Nosh Contractor through his Sonic um, Lab. And this is an illustration. Uh, I've got a person who's playing a character, a human male at the top. I'm looking at uh, social collaboration ties. So what depth of access do I let this other person have to my house? How much mentoring have I done with this person? Have we joined up in helping a third person come along uh, in the um, uh, game? The bolder the line, the heavier the coordinating tie, the collaborating tie uh, with this other person. The human male is part of a house, which is that dense cluster you see him in, and then he's got some collaborating ties up at the top. At the bottom, this person likes to play the female role from time to time. Notice he plays that role with a completely different set of people. The dots at the bottom are not connected to the dots uh, at the top. In the middle is an exploratory role where it looks like a network broker. When he plays the role of a high elf, uh, it's got a lot of open ties. Yeah, this would be a low constraint network. Are you okay with the imagery? What I'm going to ask is, how often do people build consistent networks across the characters they play, holding constant experience in the virtual world? Here's the first answer. About a third to 40% of the variance in networks is within people. People absolutely have a style. They have a way. So if I'm starting out a project, about a third of the time, I will build a network that looks like the other projects that I've done. The equation across the top is, this is a fixed effects model, very simple kind of imagery. NK is the network index for my kth role, my kth character. I'm going to regress that across P, which is my network relevant personality, which you see computed to the side. How did I compute this? I just averaged the networks that you built in the different roles you play. So this is what you do on average. And if you'll remember when you had James and Robert, you could average some and it would be a good representation of all three. If you average the others, it'd be a very poor representation of all three. And then I've got control variables, the X's. These are experience variables. How many characters have you played? How long have you been in world? How much time have you spent in this particular character? Okay, so that's the rough um, uh, across the top. The pie charts are uh, showing you how much variance in network variability, the different factors account for. So the bold red is the average network you build accounts for X amount of variance in the specific network you built in this character. And you'll notice for number of non-redundant contacts, that's just how many dis disconnected um, uh, people do you have, it's 32% for network constraint, the index I showed you before, it's 38%. So it's roughly a third to 40% is what you do repeatedly. You can see your in-world experience doesn't matter much, but your in-world experience in the character matters tremendously. The more time people have spent in a character, the more likely they've built an open network around it because they've found lots of people to collaborate um, with. And then there's a lot of residual variation that can't be accounted for by this average tendency. So the first answer is about a third to 40% of the variance in network is due to personality. This would suggests that you really need to consider the person when you model network effects. We're two slides away, hang on. Now I'm going to regress achievement, and achievement here is the character level I've developed, which on, on a sidebar we won't deal with here, but on a sidebar um, seems a good uh, measure of uh, performance in world. I'm gonna regress it across that average network you tend to build, and I'm going to regress it across all the controls, which are very important for achievement. And then I'm going to add in the network that you built around this particular character. So think for a moment. It would be easy to lose this. I'm losing you. I can see, uh, see that, but I'm, I see you. Yeah? Uh, so, so I've got a character I'm playing. This character has reached a certain level. I'm going to predict that level from the average network I build around characters, the network I built around this character, and controls for experience. The pie charts show you that now this average tendency of how I build a network accounts for almost none of my achievement in a particular character. It's that little red sliver. It's 1% and 2%. Almost nothing. 
the enormous variation that gets predicted in achievement is due to situation specific things. How much time have you spent in this character and what kind of network did you build in this particular character? It doesn't matter what you built in the other ones. What matters is what you built in this one. So I'm left with two conclusions, which I'm going to show you in a slide, but I will tell you uh, now. Conclusion one, there's very clear evidence of a network style that people bring into a situation. It's a third to 40% of the variation in networks. But it's clear that that consistent variation has nothing to do with harvesting the advantage of the network. That harvesting advantage is experience in this situation and the network you built around this particular situation. It's very situation specific, which takes us to, I'm going to pass on that, the concluding slide. And these are, are, are posted. The first is the figure five I showed you, a third to 40% of the variance is this style that people have. Second, that variance has little to do with achievement. Third, these two conclusions, the paper has a lot of checks for robustness. Um, all the robustness checks are in the direction expected, but consistently show no additional explanation from the network, the shared network. Rather, it's very situation specific. In sum, and so you're going to walk away and everything else going on with all these fun events is going to conspire to drive this out of you. So I want to emphasize, get ready for conclusion statement to be inserted in card reader. That, that shows you where I come from. Uh, the agency differences captured by network relevant personality are more relevant to style than success. People do tend to build similar networks into the different roles they play, but their consistency across roles has little to do with achievement. Network models of achievement can focus on role-specific experience and network advantage. The point being, we don't need to worry about these individual differences. They absolutely are there, but we can model the network effects directly and assume that the others will wash out with experience. The key variable that comes up is the learning uh, piece, how people learn to be in the networks uh, that they're in. And on that note, my gentle colleagues, huh? <laughs>